So hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today and welcome to these crucial discussions on the impact of the new e-visa scheme and its far-reaching implication. My name is Sara Al-Sharif and it's my honor to share today meetings with key contributors to this important conversations today as we gather to examine a policy that could significantly alter the lives of millions of migrants in the UK. The EU visa scheme, as highlighted in a report will be published by Open Rights Group, is represent more than just a shift to digitalization. It signifies a profound change in how migrants prove the rights to live, work and thrive in this country. However, this transition is fraught with risk and challenges, especially for the most vulnerable amongst us. Those who may not have the digital literacy, access to technology or support system in place to navigate this new landscape. In our report and in our discussion today, we are putting the voices of migrants and people with lived experience at the heart of the conversation. These are voices of individuals who have contributed to the fabric of our society, who seek to continue building their lives here, but now face uncertainty and potential exclusion due to the system that may not adequately support their needs. Particularly concerning are the challenges faced by refugees with travel documents who are unable to link their passport to their e-visa accounts. These individuals are trapped in a technical limbo where mismatches between their nationality and travel documents prevent them from successfully setting up their UKVI accounts. This issue reveals a broader failure of the Home Office to acknowledge and accommodate the diverse need of migrants and refugees within its system. The lack of a comprehensive duty of care and an inclusive policy approach has left many feeling abundant. The mental toll of navigating this bureaucratic maze, marked by recurring technical errors and inadequate support, is profound. For refugees and migrants, this can seriously limit their freedom of movement, as they are left in a constant worry over whether they will be able to travel or return to the UK without incident. You can explore the findings of the report through an exclusive summary will be sent to you at the end of our event today. And diving through the results of report tools that developed by the 3 million, it becomes evident that the emotions experienced by migrants dealing with the e-visa system are intense and varied. Many have expressed deep anxiety and fear over the possibility of being unable to prove their immigration status. The fear of being stranded abroad or unable to return to the UK looms large of these whose visa information is incorrect or unrecognized. Frustrations and helplessness are common, driven by repeated technical failures and the lack of timely or effective assistance. These frustrations had e has even led to lost opportunities such as job offers in dream industries and delayed crucial process like mortgage applications. The experience of these migrants reveal a growing sense of distrust and confusion towards the system. The inconsistency and errors in recording their status have left many feeling insecure about their future in the UK. For those lacking digital literacy or access to the necessary technology, this process has exacerbated feeling of isolation and vulnerability. We will hear from experts today who have examined the new e-visa scheme, identifying not only its technical flaws, but also the potential of human rights violations in it may entail. We will discuss the risks of creating a second Windrush scandal, where people who have lived here for decades may suddenly find themselves without the ability to prove their rights to remain. Moreover, we will explore the urgent need for alternative solutions and better planning to prevent a crisis that could leave thousands undocumented or unable to access essential services. Our speakers today bring a wealth of knowledge and experience. Zoe Bentelman, the Legal Director of Immigration Law Practitioners Association, ELPA, a barrister and an editor of the Journal of Immigration, Asylum and Nationality Law. Kiza Topin, as a head of policy and advocacy at the 3 million. She is an immigration lawyer with over 15 years experience in advocating for migrants to the UK. Alongside her work at the 3 million, she also maintains a practice at a barrister in the UK immigration courts. Kupa Jopolineski is a lecturer 
in a digital soci sociology at the University of Bristol. His research investigates design and operational aspect of digital identity systems in the public administration and migrations governors. This session will be recorded and we will be sending the link and two page summary of our report to you by tomorrow. Uh, hello everyone, hello Zoe. Um, can you talk, uh, can you give us a, an view about the e-visa scheme and how it will work and uh, potential communication and engagement and updates with the Home Office? Hi Sarah, thank you so much. Yes, I would be happy to. Um, I'm going to begin by providing maybe a little bit of context for people who aren't too familiar with e-visas and then move on to talking through some of the key concerns and issues that we still see. So as um, many people will know, biometric residence permits, BRPs, and biometric residence cards, BRCs, in addition to stamps and stickers that people have in their passports, are the current pieces of hard proof that millions of us migrants in the UK have to show our immigration status here. Right now, you can use these permits in order to create a code that shares information about your immigration status with your employer, with your landlord, and other third parties. But you have this physical piece of documentation, which we think is really important for some people who have been here for decades, who may not be working or renting, they may never have had to engage with that share code process to share their details. They have their physical piece of proof, which they can put in their pocket, in their handbag, and carry around with them everywhere. When I had a BRP, I carried mine everywhere, and many of my family members still do. And in the hostile culture that we have in the UK at the moment, particularly, which migrants face, I think it's really important to be able to prove your right to be here at any time, to show it to airlines, to show it to border officials, to show it to the police, to show it to anyone who might want to see it. Um, however, all of these BRPs and BRCs, or, or the vast majority, are going to expire in just over a few months at the end of 2024. And that's the case, even if migrants have permission to be in the UK next year, 2024, the year after in 2026, or even have indefinite permission to be here. In 2020, the Home Office took the decision to short date BRPs and BRCs, so most issued after that date will expire at the end of this year. Some issue before that date may still be valid after the end of this year, but that's a very, very small minority. First, the Home Office took that decision because their um, cards didn't incorporate the encryption technology that the EU required, but when that restriction was lifted, the UK still decided to keep short dating these BRPs, including for people who have indefinite permission to be here. And that's because the Home Office wanted to move to this um, system, which it calls digital by default. But really what it is, is a digital only immigration system. It's the only form of immigration status that people will have will be this digital status that you can access online. And they become to rule it out in the past few years. The first people affected were people who were on the EU settlement scheme and then Hong Kong pianos and then skilled workers and students. And so slowly different migrants in the UK um, have had the digital status rolled out to them. But there have been teething issues and not all of them have been fixed by the Home Office in these past few years. They've still moved relatively quickly to the system. Uh, in addition, millions of migrants in the UK were never granted any visa because they weren't on one of the routes where you, you received any visa from the get-go. So to avoid any gap in the proof of their status once their BRPs or BRCs expire at the end of this year, what they can do now is create a UKVI account. And that's an account that you can use to access your digital system online. And, and the Home Office has now finally, after months and months of delay, opened this. So you should be able to use reference numbers like your BRP card number to go and to open a UKVI account and to check that your status is correct, to check that your details are correct. Unfortunately, the Home Office opened this relatively late in the year especially given that they had this plan for many, many years. They decided to only open it in recent months. And that meant that we're worried that not, not everyone in the UK, the millions of migrants who have proof that's expiring, will go on and open their account before the end of this year. 
which means that from the 1st of January next year, they might not actually have any proof that is available to them readily to prove their status in the UK. And what's more, once they do get access to their online status, there have been problems and flaws and glitches in the Home Office's systems and databases, which mean that their status might not be correct. And the 3 million was actually the organisation who realised this many years ago when they saw the issue of entangled status, where it's um, you're logging in to show your details, but someone else's face shows or someone else's date of birth or even someone else's status shows. And so that's a real problem for people which has existed for years and the Home Office has still not fully resolved. So it is really important to try to go and open that UK VI account as soon as you can to make sure that your status is right. But here we are four months away from the phasing out of all of these uh, physical pieces of evidence. And we have this cliff edge deadline of the end of the year. And there are still insufficient plans in place to help the millions of people who might be affected. And that's why we say it's like Windrush. Of course, um, there is xenophobia behind so many of these policies, including the hostile environment, which is part of of the impact that migrants in the UK will feel if they aren't able to prove their status. But the real issue is, like the wind rush generation, there are people who have the right to be here or people who have permission to be here, including indefinitely, who won't be able to prove it. And in combination with the hostile environment measures in the Immigration Act 2014 and 2016, which were introduced just over a decade ago now, what we'll see is that the landlords, the airlines, um, the employers will essentially become quasi-border force and prove people to prove that people show their status in order to rent, in order to work, in order to travel back to the UK where they have the right or ability to live and reside. So that's the fundamental issue is that at the end of this year, people won't have that proof. And the Home Office has been very, very poor on communications, just like they were poor with the deadline to apply to the EU settlement scheme in 2021. Here they are being poor about this cliff edge deadline um, to sort out people's digital status by the end of this year. And so our concern is that the moment when someone will realize that there's something that's gone wrong with this status is the moment when they'll have to prove it, when they're in that line to board their plane and they can't convince an airline let them on because they're not able to access the internet and prove their digital status for whatever reason the home office um, isn't able to tell the carrier to let them on and not all carriers have this interactive technology in order to speak to the home office and check whether people have that status or the moment when they want to rent and we know what a difficult rental market it is at the moment and they could easily be passed up for someone else who can show their right to rent in the UK or their right to work, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, our concern is that the Home Office really has no backup plan, no safety net for people who cannot comply, who are unable to comply by the end of this year. There's a real lack up, a lack of joined up thinking that the Home Office has across all their different plans. They want to roll out this electronic travel authorization scheme so that all people who can currently visit the UK without applying for a visa first actually need to go through this authorization at the same time as they're having this other digital only immigration system for e-visas. And they haven't yet thought and connected the dots about how it will affect people, how people who can't prove their status might be forced to show um, that they have authorization to come to the UK as a visitor instead, when they don't need to be here as a visitor because they have the right to be here. We're also concerned that there's really no transitional period at the end of this year. There's this cliff edge deadline of the 31st of December 2024. And after that date, if people have old documents, if people have wet ink stamps, for example, in their passports, it looks like the Home Office isn't going to allow them to travel. And we know that there are many people in the UK who haven't really engaged with the immigration system for many years, but they have the right to be here indefinitely and they've been living here for decades just like the Windrush generation. What they'll have, and these are likely to be elderly people and also people who might not have um, good technical and digital literacy, what they're likely to have is an old wet ink stamp and one of their old passports that says that they have indefinite leave to remain. But what they won't have done is get a PRP because they'll never have had to have proven the right work or rent, they might be living with family, they might be living in a house that they own, they might not no longer be working because they're retired. 
And now it looks like the Home Office isn't going to allow them to travel together with their new valid passport and their old expired passport that contains that wet ink stamp that doesn't expire and has no expiration date on it. So they wouldn't know that they need to update it, won't allow them to actually travel back to the UK. And this is coming at a crucial time in the year. Lots of people travel over winter holidays, especially migrants, to see family back home. And so it could be a real issue where they're they're able to leave the UK, as we all know, because the Home Office doesn't care if you leave the UK. But when they travel back in, then they'll say, actually, we're not going to accept this wet ink stamp because you don't have one in your current passport, when of course we know the Home Office hasn't been doing wet ink stamps with indefinite leave to remain for some time now. And so it's going to be a problem if they don't have their digital status set up. Um, the other issue that we have is, um, as Sarah said, that the people who are going to be most likely the worst affected when the 1st of January comes next year are people who are vulnerable to the hostile environment. We're talking about people with disabilities, learning difficulties, language barriers, age barriers, children in care, um, people who have been victims of domestic abuse and other crimes may be the people most likely not to receive any communications that the Home Office has been giving out. And I don't know about you, I haven't really heard that much communication from the Home Office to the public about this cliff edge deadline, which they deny is a cliff edge deadline. There's also going to be the issue that not everyone has access access to the smartphone that they need, or to the internet even, in order to enable them to set up their UKI account or to access their status. Um, and so they're much more likely to fall into that hostile environment that we were talking about. And we've all seen that with, for example, the move to contactless cards that when you go to the supermarket, sometimes elderly people struggle to pay for their groceries because they don't have a contactless card. They want to pay with cash. It's the very same thing with wet ink stamps and passports or old vignettes and passports. And so there are certain cohorts of people who are going to be more affected than others. I think Sarah already named a really important one, and that is refugees. There's just been a complete utter lack of thinking from the Home Office, even in our recent engagement about refugees. They have yet um, to enable their UKVI account, to allow people to attach their travel document, which is issued by the Home Office, to their UKVI account to prove the rights. And yet they have been issuing refugees, these BRPs that also expire at the end of this year. So that's one cohort of people that's going to be badly affected. The second one are um, the group of people with legacy documents who won't be able to travel, for example, with their wedding stamps after the end of this year. The third category of people um, seems to be people with certificate of entitlement of the right of abode. And that is a, a small and ever narrowing category of people. But there are many people, including Commonwealth citizens who aren't British citizens who are here, who have the right of abode. And so literally, they're not subject to immigration control. And yet the Home Office has no plan yet that it's informed us about, about how they intend or when they intend to digitalize that form of status and whether or not carriers will actually be accepting that physical documentation if they're expecting everyone to prove um, their, their documentation digitally or to interact with the Home Office. And the Home Office still has not changed its carrier's liability guidance, which means that carriers like airlines and train operators are likely to be risk averse when it comes to letting people on because they don't want to be subject to a civil penalty issued by the Home Office. And so that means that if they have the choice about whether to let someone on who they're not sure about and be subject to a civil penalty, they're unlikely to want to take that financial hit. And so that means that they're likely to be risk averse and to refuse boarding, but that can have a real impact on people coming back to reside here, to see family, to come back to work, study, et cetera, et cetera. And the final issue which we're really concerned about is the lack of a helpline. So right now we have the Resolution Center, which is not brilliant. Um, we have We Are Digital, um, who are again, not that helpful. And it, it's only they're only available um, during UK operating hours, when people could be traveling internationally at a time that's outside of um, UK working hours, 
they'll have someone who they're able to call to help them to speak to the carrier um, to make sure that they can access their digital status and catch their flight, for example. And so that is a real fundamental issue that the Home Office needs to listen to all of us about. And we've said what the Home Office needs to do is to have a properly staffed 24-7 helpline that has translation services that people can use in order to um, resolve any issues that they have in relation to their digital status. Thank you, Zoe, uh, for this briefing. And I'll come back to you after we uh, finish the, uh, speaking like to for more details about the international carriers and shifting the responsibility to them. But let's uh, listen from Kiza about like, uh, you have an experience, you already lived this before. You, this is a kind of deja vu, but on a wider scale with EUSS. So please tell us about your experience and with EUSS. And I know that the three millions have a proposal for alternative for the digital only status. So I'd like to hear this from you. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Good to see so many people on the call. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Kezia Tobin from an organization called The Three Million, and I think we've been invited to be part of this session because we are an organization that's focused on advocating for the rights of EU citizens and their family members who remained in the UK after Brexit, because as, as you've already heard, that group of people, which are people who have applied for leave to remain under the EU settlement scheme, were the sort of guinea pigs for the rollout of digital immigration status. So everyone with status under the EUSS, as it's called, the settlement scheme, has digital only immigration status. Um, and at the 3 million, we don't do legal casework ourselves, but we get a lot of people reporting to us. We have a special tool that people can uh, use to report their issues to us. Um, and we have seen vast numbers of problems over the last few years for people arising out of challenges that they've encountered through accessing or even obtaining digital immigration status. And we've been working for many years, not only us, many others, including Zoe and her colleagues at ILPA, and also many others who I can see are on this call today, um, to try to really engage the Home Office in a kind of constructive consultation and a con constructive dialogue about the direction that digital immigration status is headed and needs to be headed. And um, the Home Office has set up several fora and consultation groups through which they um, invite input from people working in the sector who are experiencing things or are in touch with individuals who are experiencing these issues. Um, but our um, sense is that actually the process is being sort of steamrolled through. The rollout is happening. The, the This cliff edge that Zoe was talking about of the 31st of December at the end of this year is, is seemingly unmovable, um, though it could be moved. The Home Office could move it. Um, it's a fully self-imposed deadline. Um, and while there have been slight adjustments to the way that the digital status has been rolled out, it's really that the Home Office is tinkering, is, is hearing a lot of input and is tinkering around the edges with the, the existing plan. Whereas from our perspective, what we see is a very clear need for a complete rethink of digital status. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on a few of the problems that we've seen uh, and that people have reported to us, kind of uh, re-emphasizing some of the points that Zoe has already made because she's already set, um, set out what the, the kind of um, main raft of problems are. Um, and of course, the first group is people who are digitally illiterate or people who don't have access to the technology that's needed to really participate in a digital process. That should be fairly obvious that those people will be entirely excluded. And as, as Zoe said, you know, elderly people in a supermarket usually can pay in cash. Banks, when they introduce digital systems, don't do away with everything that isn't digital because it's clearly apparent that there are people in our society for whom that just is never going to, to work. So that's the, the first group of people that have really struggled. But there are these other issues that actually affect all of us. Um, and they are problems with accessing um, the internet at the right moment through not having enough battery in your iPhone or through not having 4G or Wi-Fi signal when you are in that moment where you need to prove 
that you have the the right to remain in the UK and, and the associated rights that come with that. And we've also seen that there are problems with the home office system collapsing, going down into shutdown mode. And this has happened several times. This is not theoretical or something that we think might happen in the future. It's something that has happened and repeatedly. There were several days, in fact, last August in the middle of the summer holidays where the home office system went down and people were stranded abroad at airports trying to, when they were trying to come back in. And then the third issue is these glitches and problems with the system itself, resulting in the sort of corrupted status and corrupted data that gives rise to the, the instances that you just heard about where someone might log on to the system to show their immigration status to a prospective employer. And instead of seeing their name and their photo, instead they see someone else's name and their photo or their own um name but someone else's photo and you can just imagine the kind of difficulties that this um, causes for people because in our experience the points at which people need to prove their immigration status tend to be a sort of crunch time moments you know they're, they're moments of some urgency for for many people it might be the point at which they want to accept a job offer and it may be that for, for many more skilled workers who have applied for a tailored role that is exactly suited to their, their skill set, a prospective employer might be um, willing to wait a while for them to go and contact the resolution centre and try to uh, get their status corrected, who might be sympathetic to them, uh, to, the, to the candidate and be willing to wait a while. Um, but for people who are working, for example, in the gig economy, delivery drivers and, and people doing those sorts of jobs, the reality is that those employers aren't going to wait. They're going to give the job to somebody else. And we've seen that time and time again with status holders under the EUSS, that people are, are being bypassed and overlooked and are having offers retracted that had previously been made. And the same goes for, for renters. I'm sure we all are familiar with how competitive the rental market is at the moment. It's it's um it's it's a fairly brutal market, and and if somebody comes along um, with a deposit and then is not able to to pass that um, that check that of course the landlord is mandated to carry out because there are huge consequences for landlords if they don't take undertake those those um, right to rent checks. Um, the reality is that that landlord is going to to bypass them and and give the the property to somebody else. We had one person contacting us a few months ago who um, was really struggling um, to decide whether or not to to um, forego a course at university because she was not able to secure a rental property anywhere near the the place where she had an offer of a course at university and so she couldn't move away from home which was many hundreds of miles away and there was just no no way for her to to get to to class in the morning unless it was through sofa surfing so it has very real life consequences for people and and can cause a huge amount of stress um as as Zoe said, the 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 methods through which people can fix these problems is just not really working adequately at the moment. There is a helpline. It's not it's not functioning quickly. Um, well, it's not it's not round the clock, and it doesn't um, address problems for people. A lot of the time, the people on the end of those calls, even though they might want to be helpful, are simply not able to to fix the problems that um, that people are encountering. So we've come across a lot of people who are faced with this corrupted digital immigration status, for example, who who aren't able to get their right digital their their status corrected, should we say, for weeks or even for months. So it can be a really protracted process and it has a lot of knock-on effects on people, um, people's, you know, the other aspects of people's lives and in the long run, of course, on, on their mental health um, and possibly physical health as well. Um, and then the the other instance is is travel, which Zoe's touched on as well. And and we are we we share the concerns around this because we think that there will be a vast number of people who find themselves stranded abroad in early 2025 when they haven't either applied for digital status because they haven't seen any of this minimal communication that the Home Office is putting out about it, or they have it, but 
but they encounter a problem with proving their status on re-entry. And um, of course, that will mean that people are not able to come back in time for their kids to start school again. They're not going to be able to come back to um, take up job offers or in fact to go back to work. And it will result in families being separated. And um, because the numbers of people for whom this is going to be an issue are going to increase so ex exponentially because it's going to be all migrants who are not, yeah, all, all migrants. Um, I think it's fair to expect that the waiting times for these issues to be resolved is going to increase as well. Um, and the reality is that though the Home Office say that they are engaging with carriers and explaining the process, individual airline check-in counter <clears throat> agents at airports around the world are not likely to know about the rollout of the UK system. They're not also likely to often be very willing to go onto a UK government website um, and enter details there. A lot of what we've heard, because this is already something that's affected a lot of European citizens, what we've heard is that um, you know a lot of check-in counter officials are not actually allowed to log on or not even able to log on to, to websites that are external. It's often known, often those computers at check-in desks are only connected to internet systems, not the, the wider internet. Um, and so we anticipate that there will be a lot of, a lot of issues around this. Um, and the communications concern relates not only externally, but also internally as well, because there are consequences for people here in the UK, even who are trying to, um, for example, access benefits from the Department of Work and Pensions. What we've heard is that some DWP decision makers are letting people know that their entitlement to benefits are going to be curtailed because there's an expiry date on their BRP. So even other government officials in other government departments don't seem to, to, to appreciate and understand the way that this rollout is happening. And so if, if communications within government aren't even clear, of course, um, externally, it's likely to be much worse. Um, so we're really um, urging the Home Office, us and many others are urging the Home Office to rethink the rollout of digital status. Um, the Home Office likes to point to the example of Australia, which has a fully digital system to say, well, look, Australia's managed it and it's working well. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of, of how well or well or, or not that that has been working. But what we do know is that Australia took around a decade to roll this out gradually. It was a phased introduction, whereas what we're faced with here is not a phased introduction. It was a brief trial period from which it seems very few lessons have been learnt, and then the, the rollout is total at the end of this year. Um, so we're urging the, the Home Office to rethink the timing of that. But secondly, we really think that what needs to happen is a real rethink of what digital immigration status in the UK is going to look like. Um, we know that it's going to happen. Every, everything in the world is moving towards a more digital way of functioning. Um, and you'll hear more from, from Cuba uh, about the, the kind of technical side of things and, and why this, this rethink is needed as well in a few minutes. But um, at the 3 million, we've got an alternative QR code proposal, which we've been plugging for a number of years now, um, which we think uh, could work very well in place of the current system. And it's, um, it's a proposal that has been uh, given a seal of approval by many others, um, including, including people working with airlines as well. And what it, uh, I'm going to, in fact, put a link to it because that is something I have here to hand. So I'm going to just put a link to our proposal in the chat. And if those of you on the call who haven't seen it before have a moment, please take a look at it. If you like it and have uh, comments on it, please tell us. If you think there's something that needs improving or something, a problem that you see with it, please also get in touch and let us know because we really do want that feedback. And if you think it's great, um, you could try telling your MP about it um, and suggesting that they raise it as well. But the way it would work would be that somebody would have um, uh, an app on their phone, a, a QR code um, like the ones that you get when you book a Eurostar ticket or an airline ticket. You know, you can print it off so that if your battery dies or something goes wrong and you can't connect to the Wi-Fi, you still have a paper version that you can hand over and it can be scanned and all of the information that's that the, the checker needs is contained within that, that QR code. And they can be secure as well. Um, the UK government has form on this. 
you know, during the pandemic, um, the NHS rolled out at very short notice um, an app that we were all required to download that had information in it regarding our COVID jabs and vaccines. So whenever anybody needed for travel purposes or otherwise to see proof that we'd had our vaccinations, we were able to simply show the QR code. And that could be something that we had on our phone printed or the home office could also provide simple, cheap to produce cards. Um, and um, we've we've discussed this um, in, in many ways with the home office and with government officials. Um, They've raised issues with it, with it, which we've rebuffed. And in the last few months, there has been some acknowledgement from the Home Office that there might be a benefit to be had in an offline token, is what they've called it, um, which we see as an indication that there is a need, uh, you know, a recognition that there is a need for something other than a simply digital system, which is what we have at the moment. So we're very keen to... Um, to push this idea further and to get input. So please, please do take a look at that. I'm also, just before I hand over um, or back to Sarah and over to Kuba, I just want to put in the chat one other, um, oh, sorry, I realized that I said I was putting that in the chat earlier and then I sensibly only sent it to my co-panelists. Um, it seems, is that right? Have I only sent it to the panelists? I don't think I have an option of sending it anywhere else. Maybe could somebody I'll sort it? Thank you. I'm going to put another link in there. So it'd be great if that could be shared as well, which is to um, a form that we have um, put together with ILPA through which people are able to report the problems that they have with digital immigration status. And it's only through gathering information about the problems that people are encountering that we really are equipped with the right messaging and the information that we need to be able to have these con conversations in a constructive way and to be able to, to, to help provide examples to the Home Office and the government of where things need fixing. So if um, you or anybody else, anybody else you know, um, encounters any issue with digital immigration status, whether it's obtaining it or proving status through it, please share this website with them and, um, and report the issue um, because it's really important that that as much information on on these issues is, is gathered as possible um, i'll stop there thank you sarah thank you pisa for this it's uh, i think like and thank you for the updating about the potential recognition of the flying token i think this is a kind of development like we we didn't hear it uh, before from the home office so hopefully they can adopt something like that uh, in future and moving to Cuba, I'd like I'd like to I'd like I'd like you to, to to give us um like your view about like the digital only status and how much like uh, like the Home Office saying about this system as digitalizing this system how accurate this is, and the risk of digital only status and the risk of like um, processing on uh, the e visa scheme uh, as we see now. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thanks everyone for turning up and good numbers to to the webinar about what we see, what we think is a is a huge issue um, and and a bit of a ticking time bomb. Um, so just to um, respond directly to your question, Sarah, it, it is true that the system is digital only. I mean, there are some excep exceptions to it. There are, there are ways to uh, prove status. Um, um, under the USS that don't involve the digital status, but effectively, you know, for, for in the vast majority of cases, it is it is digital only. But um, but I would say that that's not the main problem with it. The main problem with it is that it's online only. Um, so uh, the, the, and that's that's a very important distinction to make because a digital um system does not imply that it has to be online only and real time. And I think the reason why we're where we are is because the Home Office decided to go for an online only system and a system that checks or actually generates status in real time. Because this is another thing where I would seize on as an academic and and you know it may seem like it's it's just semantics that I insist on saying that status is generated rather than checked um, for the website. But um but but I'll explain why why I say so and why I think effectively it is. It is only in the moment of the status check that it actually exists, and otherwise, it's it's just a myriad of dispersed records. Um, so Kizia very helpfully put in the the link to the QR proposal by the three million, and it does have a description of 
um, what's happening at the front end of the view and proof system because because it's called view and proof uh, view and proof by the home office so um, everyone can have a look and see and if you want to see it in um, real life you also can you just can open a browser window put view and proof uk into google and and the first website that will pop up will be the view and proof website so you can see that the kind of the front end um, of the system and it, it kind of um, it, it may even appear like it resonates with the promise of simplicity because because um, because um, the whole narrative um, that the Home Office deploys to justify this move is that it's a simple and straightforward system, and you know um, it's easier, um, it's it, it's easy to use, and it is kind of Web one zero. If you if 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 you look at the View and Proof website, you put in your uh, document number that you used for application. That's actually quite important. It's not any document that you have; it's the document that is linked to the particular status that you want to show, um, and then you put in your name and date of birth, um, uh, your email or phone date of birth, and you can you can go through the steps. But um, uh, but we were uh, very interested um, in in what lies uh, behind that website and what's 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 beyond it, because obviously that's 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 just the kind of display um, of 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 digital status that you're looking at when you when you look at it, um, and. Um, when I say we, I mean um, the project at uh, the University of Exeter that I was part of and the collaboration with the Three Million and, and, and Monique Hawkins and Kizia um, Tavern in particular. Um, and we were doing all sorts of work, interviews, um, observation at stakeholder events, um, analyzing documents. And what we found is quite astonishing. So um, the kind of, um, when you say, pe people talk about, you know, the importance of setting up um, a UK VA account, and, and Zoe was, was, was talking quite a lot about it, how that's the key. But UK VA account is also not the, the, the place where, 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 where the status is held. It's just the kind of um, login um, to, 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 to the whole um, ecosystem uh, of platforms that, um, that hold um, immigration status. Um, and the most astonishing thing to me in, in the process of finding out how it works was that um, we're trying to map out how many different systems there actually are. Because when we're seeing the first glitches, it quite often um, it quite often was caused by the fact that people would have multiple records on multiple systems. When the USS was launched, the Home Office um, commissioned uh, uh, or bought um, uh, PEGA case working system um, to process USS applications, but then um, the Home Office already was using a case information database, which was rolled out, I think, in the year 2000 and it was still being used in 2018 when the USS started and it used it for some kinds of case work. Then it started migrating things onto Atlas, which is another case working systems. And and that that kind of that leads you to a question, oh, so how many, how many places where your status might be are there? Um, in 2015, there was an FOI um, request submitted to the Home Office asking about case working um, um, systems. And the Home Office came back with, with a response that listed seven different case working tools and a bit of, bit of detail about, about each of them. Um, this FOI, Freedom of Information request, was repeated in, in year 2022. Um, and the request simply asked for um, an up to date list of case working tools. Um, used by the Home Office. The Home Office refused that um, uh, that request under Section 12 of the Freedom of Information Act, which is the cost exemption. And they basically said it would be too costly to um, answer that question because there are currently over 90 different casework systems within the UK VI space, 90, 90. Um, so when, you, when we talk about digital status, we think about something that is kind of uniform, right? But uh, but your records may be in 90 different places, and they quite often end up being in more than one anyway. Not quite often; they're always in more than one. Um, and 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 that's that's where that's where things get complicated. That's where um, the glitches start occurring. Um, with the three million, we're um, trying to map out and um, those glitches and the types of glitches, and that was that was mostly based on the on the reported tool. Um, and there is. So many, so many types of them that 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 you know, to, if I would run out of time if I wanted to talk about all of them. But just to give you some examples, in the UK VI um, and and the EVISA will be will be will be no different because it runs off the same the same tools. Um, so first, you may encounter problems when um, the service is unavailable, and I think Easy I mentioned that that there were already a few instances where you go to that link, the view and proof, and and it's just dead, so you can't even get started. 
But then um, there is another type of glitches where um, you can you can actually access your UKVA account. So you can you can log on, you can go through the first steps, um, but then you can't access the profile page. So um, so you can log on. The system does recognize you. The UKVA account recognizes you. But the system that has to communicate with your UKVI account does not. That system is called the person-centric database. And that's the kind of main platform that links with all those different 90 different casework systems um, and draws information um, from them. So there may be a problem there. And then you can log in, but you cannot access um, your profile anyway. Um, then you may be able to log in and access your profile page, but there will be things missing. And um, again, a very evocative example is where uh, people were um, logging on USS status holders and not seeing their photo. That was a very common glitch that was occurring um, probably three or four years ago. Um, and the office, the Home Office actually explained why that was the case. And they said that in the early stages of the USS rollout, they didn't want to um, they didn't want to reject people because they submitted um, a photograph, photo that was of insufficient um, resolution when they applied for status. So they were accepting low resolution photos. Um, and then as the system matured, they um, increased the threshold uh, for the photos on the person-centric data platform. And basically, if your photo, which resides in another, in the um, information, uh, biometric, biometric um, uh, information store, if that photo was of insufficient resolution, then the person-centric data platform would not load it to your profile page, and you could still see your status, but you couldn't generate the share code. So that was another, that, that's another step. So that's, um, that, that's, that's the thing that was happening. Just because the Home Office changed the technological requirements, nobody was told about it. This, this wasn't communicated. It's only uh, when we noticed um, the, the the problem occurring and when we asked, they said, "Yes, this is this is actually not a glitch. This is how this is this is a feature of 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 the new changed um, um, digital status um, service that the photo has to be of a higher resolution. So if you have a lower one, you have to update it. All the service will not work." But nobody was told that. Um, um, and then um, the, the kind of the most probably shocking examples were the ones that were um, alluded to by both Zoe and Kizia, uh, where we see um, entangled status. So where you log on and see, you see a photo, but it's showing somebody else, or you see the your photo, but it's showing somebody else's name. And we've interviewed um, quite a few people um, with the 3 million who had that problem. They literally showed us their, their profile and that's what it was showing. Um, and that's kind of, um, uh, I think, worth dwelling on a bit because that's 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 really the core issue. I think why why digital status, as it is implemented currently, is so problematic. Um, basically, um, Kizia mentioned the um, COVID app, the NHS app, um, which the NHS rolled out very quickly, and you know you could you could show or, or evidence your vaccination status with a QR code um, using the app. Um, and it worked well for most people, right? Um, the key difference between the NHS app and digital status is that in the NHS, you do have a unique um, unique number. You've got your NHS number, and that's something that identifies you uniquely across NHS services. Um, UK immigration status does not have that. Um, there is not no single identifier for a person in, 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 in home office databases. Um, there are application reference numbers, but they're obviously deferred by application. And then you have your uh, personal identifiers, such as the date of birth, um, but that's you know shared by many people, such as your name. Again, somebody may somebody else may have the same name, um, or you may change your name. Um, email address is unique, but then you can change your email address. So there isn't anything that would tell the home office systems that you is really you. Instead, what the um, what, what, what the um, person centric data platform is doing, it's basically computing you from all those various records. It's, it's matching them probabilistically. And then when the logic goes wrong, it will assign somebody else's status or photo or whatever else um, to your to your profile. Um, and that's that's why we see entangled status. Um, and again, initially we saw that um, happen to the first couple of cases I remember were um, twins and then siblings who did not have the same date of birth, but applied um, for identity documents um, at the same time. And they, their identity documents differed by literally one digit. And then the system confused them. That's where that were the first two. But since then we saw um, people confused who we don't even know how on earth um, an algorithm could could entangle those two profiles, but 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 it did 
it did happen. Um, and then um, there are errors in maintenance view. So, so for example, you um, you want to um, you want to maintain your status because again, it's not a stable thing. You um, you apply for status once, but if you change um, if you change your name, you have to you have to go online and and and, and change that as well. Um, and then there are glitches with with updating status. So quite often when you um, add a new document number. Um, when you've when you've been issued a new um, document by, uh, by by the state of, of nationality, the country of nationality, um, then uh, then the status suddenly becomes unavailable. Uh, the document number is one of the kind of keys into into online status. Um, so um, so 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 it has to be it has to be kept up to date. But quite often with with the updates, um, the updates leads to the loss of status. Um, and then there are problems with checking status. So. Everything works correctly. The system is available. You can log on. It recognizes you. It shows your correct profile. You can generate the share code, and then you give the share code to um, to, to an employer or a landlord. They put it in, and then the status is not being found on the service. Um, and that's again um, usually correlating with some changes, um, not necessarily your status change, but updates of status, basically you do anything with your online status, it can invalidate the share code. Um, so so the, the, the home office is basically insisting on a system that will compute who you are and what you are in terms of immigration law in, in real time. Um, and it may not be a popular thing to say, but um, we could have a discussion whether, you know, and digital status is desirable or not. But I think the main point to, to, to get across here is that digital status can be done in, in a zillion different ways. And the Home Office chose a, a, a slightly problematic way uh, and a way that gives it all the control and takes all of the control away from the status holder. It, it effectively creates a system where the status is, is, is in a cloud um, of, 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 home office, of Home Office servers. And but you know there is no such thing as a cloud. It's 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 a marketing term. A cloud is someone else's computer. There is somewhere there is a computer where where your record is being held. The problem with this system is that there are not ninety different computers, ninety different systems, which have dozens and hundreds of computers where your status might be, and there is no unique referent that would link them all. So and that that leads to that leads to errors. Um, and maybe I'll end by, by, by saying one thing. It's very encouraging that the Home Office um, is using the language of a token um, in, in the paper uh, that we penned with Monique and which will come out, I think, in a week's time in, in the ILPA's Journal of Immigration, Asylum and Nationality Law. Uh, we're basically making that argument that, 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 that what the Home Office did was not to digitalize status as such, but to move away from a system where you'd have a token of status, a passport, um, a stamp in the passport, a biometric residence card, a biometric residence permit, something that is tangible, not necessarily digital, not necessarily physical, you know, it could be digital like, like the QR code, but something that is tangible and, and fixes your status. They move to a system which where, where status is literally decided each time it's being checked, right? Because because the 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 the, um, the UK VA account will speak to the person-centric data platform, and the person-centric data platform will seek all the um most up-to-date information. Um which is not necessarily up to date anyway, because there will be lag between systems. Uh, but it also it also um, inevitably generates generates errors. So so I would think that if there was a token of status instead of the transactional system where you know each each check is a generation of status, if there was a token, uh, that would certainly make it much much um, safer for for the users in a world where we have to have digital status in a world where we have to have immigration documents and in a world where we have to have borders um, at all, which also are all contentious points, but but I'm not going to get there. I'm, I'm going to stop now. For this insightful and thoughtful uh, uh, idea about the digitalization, and it's like, as you said, like it's online only system. It's not a digitalizing the system or the the, the status. And I have a follow-up question to Zoe and for Kezia. Uh, it's, we are not talking about some uh, future problems. We already seeing a problems now. We already seeing people, they can't access, they already set up their UKV account or they set up the e-visa account and they can't uh, see their proof of status. 
and they can't approve this uh, this to like uh, to the bank or to apply for a mortgage or whatever we are seeing people have incorrect uh, expired date and they can't change it and they already uh, in contact with the home office or with the, with the helpline but they didn't hear back from them so what do you think like from your what is the next approach what we should do and what they should do like should they wait stuck at this until we have like 31st of December and this is uh, unsolved, still unsolved? So they, because like it's even, there is a requirement for landlord and employment and employers to check the, if the people who already will have an expired date to check their, uh, to, to check the right to work or right to rent. So what the, these people should do, like with these errors on their e-visa, they are encounter now. Um, well, so there, there are two two parts to this, I think, aren't there? The, the, what what can the person do in that in the immediacy of their own situation to fix it for the, so that they can move forwards with the ability to prove their rights? And then there's the kind of bigger question about what we what should we do to try and highlight the severity of the concerns that we have. Um, and, and the first one in terms of what an individual can do to result, to get the problem resolved, um, it's it's difficult. It's really difficult. There is the resolution center out there that are the port of call for people to go to. Um, it's 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 not um, something that is often very effective. People often end up having to go and seek legal advice and then through um, through those legal advisors try and, and get get issues resolved. Um, sometimes it even comes down to somebody taking um, the pre-action stages of judicial review against the Home Office with legal advice. But of course, that's not something that's appealing for anybody. Um, and it's very costly and very stressful and also can take a very long time. Um, but the un unfortunately, there isn't a straightforward answer to how these issues can be fixed. And this is one of the things that we've been pushing for, for a better mechanism to be put in place to help people in this sort of situation. Um, I know that some people have gone to seek help from their MPs. I think that is a good way forward as well on two fronts, because I think it's an MP can, in some cases, if you've got a proactive MP who is um, willing to listen and willing to, to kind of stick their neck out a little bit, you might be lucky and, and that MP might, if they're connected in the right ways, be actually able to help you get a resolution to your problem more quickly. Um, you know, that, that's not going to work for everybody. Um, but then equally, it's very helpful for MPs to know about these problems um, and as I said earlier, if if you if you think our proposal is a good one, please share it with your MP because I think um, one of the questions in the chat was about you know what parliamentarians can do and what role they might have, and I think putting this on the agenda for as many people as possible in Westminster is um, is is a step in the right direction. Um, but so so there, I've kind of strayed from what can somebody do in the immediacy of their situation into what can we do more broadly. Um, but I I think um, yeah I think I think putting putting this out there, publicising the issue more broadly is is a big step um, that needs to happen. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of people are now becoming more aware of. People who are working somehow in the, in the migration sector, but who maybe haven't been as involved in these issues, or people who are working in community groups, supporting individuals are suddenly becoming aware of these issues, because the number of people who are encountering problems is is um, is increasing so much. So um, word is spreading. But um, uh, yeah, I, th I think it needs to happen more. But Zoe, I don't know if you've got m more suggestions that you could add. I'm sure you do. Well, a cheeky one is definitely log it on the 3 million in ILPA's website if there is an issue, because even if you can't reach um, the Home Office, you know, Kezia and I and others do regularly meet with the Home Office regarding these issues. And so if we have the concrete case studies to prove and to show that there are far more widespread issues than the Home Office's purporting that there are, that's incredibly helpful to us in terms of our advocacy. The second thing, which I think is, is sort of an, an interesting issue, is, is the terms and conditions of the UKVI account, which we've talked about quite a bit 
at ILPA and the Home Office actually, UKVI tries to exclude liability for any loss or damage that arises from the UKVI account, including any direct or indirect or consequential loss because you're not able to use it because of disruption to access to the account, because information is lost or corrupted while data is being transmitted or processed or downloaded from the account. And also, if there's reasonable grounds to restrict or suspend or terminate access to the account, then they also don't want to take liability for any issues that result from that. And I think that's far too wide and we're encouraging the Home Office. And I think it's something we will have to do more broadly is to hold the government to account, including account for um, liability for any loss or damage that results from someone not being able to prove their status when they do in fact have that status. And a really, you know, good example of the kind of legal challenge that has been successful recently is Ramfel's um, case, which was successful to say that people who don't have access um, to prove their status during the period of time after their card might expire, but when their leave is extended by statutory provision, well, that's not lawful. And in fact, they should have digital evidence of their status during that period of time. And the Home Office is still, as I understand it, not issuing um, that evidence. And so that kind of broader challenge as well is something that we can think about. And if we have those case studies built up, that's also useful evidence in a broader legal challenge. Thank you, Zoe, for this answer. And uh, Koopa, can you tell us about uh, how much is sa the safeguarding of having our data online, on cloud, as you are saying, it's not physical anymore. So we, if we lost this, we lost it forever. We we already seen hacking incidents, glitch incidents. So can you tell us about safeguarding? How much is safe our information or our data being on cloud this way? In a state of like and just like to uh, uh, roll over like uh, the physical document mm -hmm. uh, well so I, I don't want to be the person who says oh it is not known where exactly the data uh, are being held and then somebody pops a link to an foi in the <laughs> in the chat but as far as i know nobody knows where exactly um these data are being held whether it's um home office internally unlikely where it's you know there 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 is a handful of of server space providers you know the the the, the, the amazon microsoft and you know um and and god knows where it might be um the but but the kind of I, I i'm not even sure if that's the main problem the main problem is that the data is being closed by the home office in the home office um in the vast vastness of the home office system so you know the 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 problems that that that, that we describe in in, in the forthcoming paper and that you talk about in the report, you know, those glitches, which which are obviously, you know, as, as I was trying to explain, a function of the systemic design, because that that's, you know, that they're only because they're only occur because the system is configured in a particular way. Um, those glitches are, are where, you know, somebody logs in um with uh with the correct thing and sees the wrong thing, you know. So it's not it's not even hacking, it's just um the flow of design. Um, as far as we know, there have been no instances of external um, hacking of, of these data, but obviously if that happened, the results would be um, rather catastrophic, um, just like with any, any other large-scale system that combines identity, that includes identity, people's identity data. But the, I, I think what we are seeing right now is the Home Office unable to trace status that is held by people within within its own, or correctly display it within within its own systems, and that's 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 a big problem. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, can we just move to the? I'll start uh, receiving the questions from the from the audience. So please drop your questions in the Q and A, uh, and I'll just like I'll start with. Um, uh, can like um, can MBs like Jeremy Coburn and Jerry Reiner? I think like help. Like there is a questions about the MBs. How can they help? I think this like if people have an access to this MBs, the their constituencies, they could raise these questions to them, and they could share the uh, the the approach of the three millions with them. The we will be launching soon uh, at the end of this weeks um, an MB tool. So. Uh, People can write to their MPs about the uh, EVs a problem, asking them to stop 
the the e visa uh, rollout and to provide an alternative uh, digital art alternative or physical alternative to prove the right for people rights to prove their right to be in the UK or to live and to work and to rent. Um, there's, I assume this will be difficult to codify. Uh, can I can I jump in on that, Sarah, before yes. we move on yeah. this front? Because, um, you know, we and, and others who are working in this kind of ad advocacy space are, are often um, trying to meet with immigration minister and other MPs who um, will have some persuasive sway over how big an issue this becomes. Mm -hmm. Well, not no, not how big an issue it becomes, but how you know how 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 well it's dealt with politically. Um, but of course, uh, MPs have a very different relationship with organisations like ours, who are one of very many noisy voices in their ear, and with their constituents. So we would always encourage people to, to speak to their own constituency MP, because they're more likely to be, um, to well, they're, they're you know, they, they have a, a surgery where you can go and speak to them. They might be more willing to to sit down with you as one of their constituents than they would with with a, an advocacy organisation. So, yeah, please do contact your MP. And um, I think it would be helpful um, for MPs to be encouraged not only to raise this issue, um, either in debates um, or with ministers, but also to sit down with organisations who are bringing this experience to the table. So to sit down with ILPA, with the three million, with all with other organizations who have the evidence that is needed and to actually listen to to what we're proposing and what we have to say um so if anybody is um keen to to do that and to take those steps but wants to have a conversation about it please get in touch with us um through the three million website because we would be we'd be quite happy to have a conversation about that thank you Kezia. and uh there is a question uh saying do you think the postponement of this event will uh till 2029 will be a good idea yeah it's it i just like i'll leave it to uh, to answer i just like i don't want to jump mm -hmm. so zoe kiza kuba I, I mean, I think we do need a transitional period, and that's certainly something that we have all been calling for because of this cliff edge deadline. But I would recommend that rather than imposing another arbitrary deadline like 2029 or any other date, what they actually need to do is go back to the drawing board and figure out a system that works that can actually ensure that people always have access to their status. And as Kuba was indicating, there, there might be differing views about whether a digital only system is sufficient for every person or not. It might be the case that at some future date, everyone will be digitally literate. Everyone will have a smartphone. Everyone will be able to access their status by that means. But I would suggest that we're not there now. And to be honest with austerity, I don't think that we're going to be there by 2029 personally. Yes, I agree with you. And I think like the point is not about like postponing the deadline, uh, the point is like to put in place systems that could work for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess we both, we, we all, I guess, agree that both need to happen, right? So the deadline in December is unwise, uh, but also implementing the system later will not deal with a lot of the issues that we were talking about anyway. So different system at the later stage, yeah. Um, yeah, do you think that the strict deadline is due to the Home Office uh, desires to deliver the UK border strategy 2025 on time? Or what reason do they provide you for not delaying rollout or going with a soft launch? Well, one reason they've been giving us recently is the um, propaganda about how this is so operationally efficient and the cost savings. And so we do know how difficult it is to print entry clearance vignettes and put them in passports overseas. And people will now just have access to their digital status, but they'll still have to go to a visa application center overseas to enroll their biometrics first. Yeah, 
Um, but they think it's going to be operationally much smoother for, I would say, new migrants to the UK especially, which may well be the case. But we cannot forget the millions of migrants in the UK for whom it's not going to be operationally smooth to move over to the new system. I just like strike me too, like the, I think the Home Office aware of this problem. It's something like, it's not like they didn't encounter this kind of problem before. They already have it with the Windrush before. They have it with the EU SS system. So why the insisting of repeating the same system that it's proof it doesn't work? Okay. I was um, um, presented about, about the early evidence about the glitching of the um, of the USS status, as it was then, um, at an event organized by the Public Law Project, and there was somebody from the government legal services in the audience, and 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 they were concerned about the system glitching and you know the loss of status for people who legally have status, and they raised their hand and they said, "Oh, do you have an estimate how many people it might be?" And I said, "No, we don't know, but from you know from from the number of accounts we get, you know, and the kind of the 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 actually." Um, you know, the 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 the, the limited um scope to gather information that we have. We think it's probably hundreds of people. And then that person went like, huh, you know. So I think there is there is an aspect of of that. And that was a lawyer, that was a government government lawyer at a public event. And um I think there is a degree of that, you know, because we talk, we focus on the errors. The home office focus on where the system works from their perspective. And I think there are two fundamentally different perspectives. So I'm afraid there is an element of them. Basically, I think when we say the system doesn't work and when they say the system works, we apply very different criteria as to what it means to have a functioning border system, I'm afraid. And thousands of cases where it goes wrong will not overshadow the you know millions of successful business transactions on 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 government services and that's the reality of border controls as well unfortunately there is there is an aspect of that um, i think that's such a oh sorry sarah um i was going to say i think i think that's such an Im important thing to remember in all of this you know that we're talking about um thousands of people being affected um, but the Home Office sees it the, absolutely from the other perspective. They see that as being less than, you know, less than 1% of people for whom it's been rolled out will have a problem. Um, but of course, that less than 1% are the, are the more vulnerable people who need, um, you know, the, the system needs to, to be able to cater for those people. There was an article that The Guardian published um, back in, I, I'm just trying to check when it was, it was in March, um, that highlighted, there was a, a whistleblower that highlighted that um, corrupted status had affected more than 76,000 people. Um, and the Home Office has disputed that figure. They say it's less, but but they they seem to acknowledge that it's still in the tens of thousands. But the answer has been, you know, well, that's a very, very small minority of people. Of course, it doesn't matter to those 76,000 or 45,000, however many they are, what how small a minority they are the reality is that it's that many thousands of people who are prevented from accessing their rights i think this is a part of like the hostile environment that we can see like because they don't care and it's 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 good to mention like we don't have even a quality assessment or policy assessment for the uh, for the e visa scheme the only assessment that we are having for dig digitalization and it's already acknowledged excluding certain type of people of like elderly or people with disability. But even with the e-visa, which will exclude more and more of uh, of people, there is no assessment in place to, to see how this will reflect on the people who will use it or will, will be affected uh, by the system. Would you like to add something, Cooper? No, maybe maybe just like um, another very quick point that when we think about the Home Office, there are multiple layers of the Home Office. Again, in, in, in the civil society settings or in academic settings, we quite often say the Home Office as if, as, as if it was a monolith. But I always go back to an interview that I conducted with somebody who had experience of working on those things in the Home Office. And I, at that time, I was asking about the deadline for applications for the EU settlement scheme, which everybody insisted was just a mad um, early. And... Uh, 
in the context of that conversation, that person who worked on it said that, oh, we had to work to a crazy deadline. And I was like, no, hang on a second, but it was your deadline. <laughs> it wasn't imposed by anybody else, by the but by the home office. And that person said, oh, well, I, you know, it was way above my pay scale. It's not me who came up with this. It was the politicians who came up with this who wanted to deliver Brexit on time. So I think there is also a lot of, you know, it depends where you where, where, where you locate the home office exactly. There, there may, you know, um, operationally something may not make a lot of sense, but politically it makes sense and that's why it's done or, you know, so there is that that complexity to it as well. But quite often it will be, you know, the politicians setting the what needs to be done and then the civil servants trying to find the way to do it without everything crashing. And so the responsibility for it is also sometimes limited because um, they have limited options of how and what to do. Uh, thank you, Cooper. Uh, another question saying this will be a system, um, this will be system collapse on a massive scale. Is judicial review relevant to this whole process? I think like uh, Zoe, this question to you. I think um, it's very difficult to say yet how, you know, what, what successful challenge would be brought on this basis, if any. But we should continue, as we were setting out before, to try to gather the evidence, to try to hold the government to account in any by any means that we can, so that we have this long course of action, this long course of warnings, and so that when it gets to the stage where litigation may be viable, we have that prepared and ready to go. Like with Windrush, it wasn't the case that it happened overnight. There were decades of warnings preceding it. And so the same thing, there have been years upon years of us warning about this particular issue that, and you know the issues that would arise, including for people with protected characteristics, as you were saying, Sarah, there is no equality impact assessment that's been published that I've seen. And so if we do identify that certain um, groups with protected characteristics are being discriminated directly or indirectly by this new digital only system, then that might be something for us to investigate. So yes, the more data, the more evidence that we can collect, the more helpful it would be. I mean, it's also the case that there has been new interesting developments in the immigration case law field. For example, people who have private life, who then try to make an application from outside of the UK and are refused, the, the Court of Appeal has recently found that, yes, that can engage a person's human rights. That can be a violation of their right to respect for private life in the UK. And so we're likely to see, and that, that was, you know, in the context of Windrush and in the context of people who have lived here for decades and decades, if they're suddenly locked out of returning to the UK because of that, and they have to try to make other applications and they face difficulties, it may very well be that they're human rights are breached, but it would need to be assessed on sort of a case-by-case -case basis rather than now prejudging what systemic challenge would be successful. Um, thank you for this. Um, so uh, we are hearing uh, cases where someone started application before the system was opened more widely. Uh, but they haven't had any updates on their VE visa. The question is, should they wait for start the application again? Have you heard of issue relating to application started before these dates? I can't. Uh, I can't understand quite. Well, it's not quite clear the the, the questions. But what I know is that is the application now is open for everyone to to create a UKVI account. And it's even in the UKVI account, if you created more than one from the same uh, email, it's, it shows on the page of the the, the e-visa or UKVI account that there is already an, an old one, not complete, and you already submitted one. So you can delete uh, the incomplete one and start uh, a new one. Uh, this is according to what I understand from uh, the question. Uh, would you like to add anything, Cooper and Kizia and Zoe? I, I don't think it would be, I don't think we could comment really on the individual circumstances yeah. of the applicant. I don't think that would be wise for us to do that now. Yeah. yeah. Um, Josephine? Oh, yeah. Yes. It's... But it is possible to have a duplicate UKVI account. And that has happened, and the Home Office admitted to that happening. So 
can't comment on individual cases and this sounds like legal advice, which I would never do, uh, but it definitely is possible to duplicate accounts. So you have to be quite careful with that. Yes, exactly. Uh, so Josephine, uh, hello. Uh, she is saying we are doing outreach to a group of new MPs across political parties and want to make this one of the key urgent issue we are bringing to their attention. What would be most helpful for us to ask new MP to do? Zoe, Kizia, Kuba, who wants to answer this question? I, I think we've discussed quite a bit what we think would be helpful. Personally, I would like to also see a parliamentary debate on this issue. I think it would be good to have um, attention raised more broadly. And of course, if everyone here and in the com various communities are um, writing to their MPs with case studies, then MPs will be better prepared to raise those case studies during a parliamentary debate and put some pressure on um, the new government in relation to the issue. It's of course not their policy. It's a policy that they've inherited from the previous government. And this sh should certainly be part of the narrative that they need not continue every policy of the previous government, just like with Rwanda, some things can be discarded very early on. Can I do another plug at that point? <laughs> um, uh, there's really, sorry, I'm, yeah. no, I'm not sorry. This is, it's important and the more support there are for these issues, the better. Um, but we at the Three Million have also put together a number of policy proposals for the new government um, for things that they could change and um, address within the first 100 days. And what we've been asking, um, I, I, sorry, I, I realize it's um, Josephine that's asked the question. Josephine's fully aware of this, but for others on the call that, that might not be, um, we've been asking um, organizations to lend their support and endorse the asks that we have of um, the government. And there are several, uh, I'm gonna put another link into the chat. Uh, there are several of these 10 asks that relate specifically to digital immigration status. So while they're, they're framed through the context of um, EU citizens and the EUSS, they're by no means limited to them because the, the issues about digital status apply equally for, for everybody. Um, but if you are working for an organization that could lend its, uh, you know, who, that would be willing to endorse our ask, that would be great because these are things that we're also raising um, with, with parliamentarians. And government. So I'm going to put that in there. Again, it's only going to host and panelists, but thanks. Uh, I'd like to add also that um, an open rights group in our uh, research that we're going to publish in a few days, like one of our recommendation is to stop the uh, uh, phasing out from the PRP, stop the e-visa plan now and provide alternative until we discuss and provide a digital uh, status to prove the right to work beside a physical proof too. It's something, it's a kind of inclusion system in a state of like keep excluding people out of the right to work or right to rent or right to prove their uh, right to remain in the UK. So, um, and next question, Drea, uh, thank you very much for the information, uh, informative uh, presentation. I'm curious about the specific problems you are observing for different migrants group, EU citizen, non-EU citizen, refugees, do you anticipate different types of problem for each group? I ask because I understand that share code need to be verified across different database based on legal, legal status. Um, who would like to answer this question? Maybe I can start and others can jump in, but yes, I, I think it will affect different groups differently depending on their specific needs. We talked about people with disabilities, people who don't have smartphones. We talked about refugees who aren't able at the moment to link their home office issue travel documents to the UK VI accounts. We talked about people in situations of abuse. I do think certain people will need more support than others. And what the Home Office has done now is they've said, oh, we have three million pounds very late in the day to allocate to certain organizations to help support vulnerable people. And 
uh, as far as I know, that it, it hasn't even been set up yet. We're four months, less than four months away from the deadline. And where is the support for vulnerable people to help them set up their UK VI accounts? So I do think that people who are particularly vulnerable to falling into the hostile environment will need specific support. Um, what the Home Office has said in relation not just to share codes, but more generally, is that they have all sorts of data sharing agreements with different government departments. And so, for example, DWP should theoretically be able to see whether someone does have status and so not and their benefits at the end of the year, regardless of what their BRP says the expiry date is. But whether that was manually en entered by someone, whether um, all of the sh data sharing agreements are working perfectly is very difficult to know. But apparently they have data sharing government uh, agreements with many, many different government departments. And so in that respect, it should equally impact people. But we know there are certain people who are more likely um, to interface with certain government departments and others, like people on benefits who may be more adversely and directly affected than others. Mm -hmm. Kupa, you want to say something? And uh, maybe just just to add quickly, because um the you know the, the kind of the, the those broad hide area, by the way, uh those different uh migrant groups, you citizens, non-new citizens are not necessarily mutually exclusive. And um in, in the process of tracing glitches of the USS, we saw, for example, the system malfunction for people who had multiple um types of leave. Um generally it seems that people who had past refusals or rejections struggle more because the system may flag it up. Um, they still struggle more at the border because if the border officer sees a past refused application, they're probably more likely to question them. So, so I'm not sure if it's, you know, it, it may be the gradient, maybe you citizens, non you refugees like that, but maybe it will be a bit like Zoe said, maybe this, this kind of will, you know, impact those vulnerable groups as we now see them. And maybe some of the vulnerabilities will just come up in the implementation process. Process. But I think one thing that we notice definitely is the more different types of status or refusals you have, the, the, the more problems you're likely to have because the system goes is more likely to go haywire. Thank you so much for this. And Pauline, uh, for justice for Windrush, I think we should link the dots. It's not about just the digital system. It's speaking to the Home Office about the historical issue that give us reasons for concerns which should be included in justifications or for why this is not appropriate at this time. Faceless system also goes against Wendy Williams' review, providing that there is a clear lack of understanding of one rush generation, which will only get worse with a digital system. Yeah. Yes, I think like it's it's the same repeating for the for what's happened before, but in wider scale. And without learning from the past um, lessons. Uh, there is a question about the is this is the system expensive? I'm not sure which system, the the approach, the what we approach, or or the BRP system, uh, the cost effective. I mean, the Home Office certainly um, says that the rollout of digital status is cost effective for the government and is and is much more cost effective than having to reprint um, the kind of higher quality BRP documents that they have been doing. That's one of the reasons why, they, why they've why they said they're not willing to, to reprint anymore, I think. Um, but I, I don't know the details really about how much. Yeah, I think like the, the point, like it's a cost in, in, which, in which level, like cost effective uh, on the level of like uh, the budget, but it's not a cost effective to the, the consequences over people. I think the point here is like, who whom the home office is like keen to to work or to uh, to care about like because it's not cost effective for people who will be live their life be destroyed like losing jobs or losing their homes or losing uh, like their ability to be in the UK anymore mm. um I was just going to mention one funny little tidbit, Sarah, which is that well, while I said three million pounds have been made available as grant funding to help vulnerable people with complex needs um, transition to an e-visa, the Home Office has a two year contract with Deloitte to pay them 22 million pounds for provision of transition and transformation leadership services. Mm. And um, just to take it uh, order of magnitude higher, the Immigration Platform Technologies Program, the one which developed the person-centric data platform, cost 
um, around 200 million over the first four years. So those systems may be cost effective, but they aren't cheap. And, you know, they move a lot of the cost on the person who can't get a job because their system, uh, their, their, their status is malfunctioning. So cost effective is a, that would have to be another panel. <laughs> and there are even other costs, aren't there, for, you know, of course, there's a human cost for the individuals, which of, of course needs to be um, central. Oh, we lost Cooper. <laughs> um, but um but but you know if if somebody's not able to 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 work because they're not able to prove their right to do so there will be knock on costs that the government will have to cover further down the line in other areas as well you know it's 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 very difficult to quantify these things i think i'm conscious that we've that we've reached four o'clock i'll stop yes i think like the 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 next one it's not question but it's just like uh, Mark is saying is anyone looking at how the post office scandal is relevant to this especially how hard it's to challenge computer system information and I think like it's down the line if you are relied only on the computer to give you a proof of a status without like providing an alternative people will be the the the, the victim of these systems as we as it happened with the post office scandal. Um. I think like we 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 reach the the limit for our uh for our sessions and I don't want to take more of your time, and uh, Cooper is not here to thank him. I, but I just I just sorry to to jump in. He's just texted me saying his laptop suddenly crashed, so he's really sorry that that happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh a, a different aspect of digitalization too. Some there you go. Gonna crash anytime. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Kiza and Kizia and uh, Zoe, and for this, uh, 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 yeah, thoughtful uh, session. And thank you, Jeanette, for the technical support. And for everyone, we will be sending the video to everyone who atten attended this uh, session, and we will be sending a two summary of our report. Our report will be launched by the next week, and by the end of this week, we will be launching a campaign uh targeting targeting the mps and asking for everyone to email their mps asking them to stop rolling uh the e-visa plan and provide alternative for people uh, to uh, prove the rights to uh, to work and to rent and to be in the uk thank you so much and please uh, check the report check the three millions uh, uh report tools and see you soon. And hopefully we can find a solution for this and home office could listen to us. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye.